Hey, campfire crew, let's get it on. Hey gang, I have been an armchair mountain climber for years. And while I have done my share of bouldering and some climbing, nothing like what I'm going to share in these next few stories. Don't let the technical jargon get you down. I mean, we're talking real life and death stuff here up on the peaks. I've also mixed in some really creepy tales from the trails. All of it goes into true scary stories from the mountains. And stick around at the end. I'm sharing a song from a singer-songwriter friend of mine here in western New York. His name's Bob Malucci. He's got a new album out called Resonance, and it's a song called Same Rope. Really good tune. Check it out. And now, leave us not be hasty. Let's get to the stories. A Scary Accident by Nitro Jesus 4000 My scariest accident ended up in a hospital trip. But I should have been dead. Yet I walked away, mostly. My partner and I were climbing in the South Platte for about six years ago on a hard slab test piece. The first pitch is mostly an approach pitch, an unprotected slab which is really easy for 40 or 50 feet until you reach a steep wall. Here you can place a small nut and then you move left about 20 feet and up about 10 to a bolted anchor at a stance. The next pitch was the business. Hard technical smearing with healthy bolt spacing. It was my lead. I traversed out right about 10 feet and got a bolt along the way. After another 15 or so, I started to head up the steep wall that I traversed under the first pitch and get another bolt in that transition. The steep wall was a bit of a very blunt arete or prow. After a few feet, I got to a stance on a small ledge about 8 inches wide by 18 inches long. Above that, I got another bolt right at the crux, and I was thinking, hey, this is the shit. It's actually well protected by Platt standards. So to put this all in perspective, you had to go 10 feet from the belay to the right and get one bolt. Go right some more and start to trend upward and get another bolt then 10 feet more straight up and get another one. The route continues on after that and straight up the prow, which turns into slabbier and slabbier terrain. So I clipped the bolt and started the crux smearing funkiness. Although the moves weren't going super easily and they were not obvious, the bolt was like right at my shin, so whatever, if I pitched off that bitch it would be no big deal. So I really went for it. I slipped off the smear I was on and started what I expected to be a six-foot sliding fall down a steep, slabby face. Except I kept going. I heard lots of rope whipping noises and plinking sounds. I lost my sense of where I was and what was happening and then BAM! I hit the approach slab. Lying on my back on the approach slab, I immediately blurted out to my partner, who was now above me to the left, (laughs) I'm hurt. Yeah, no shit. I was wondering what the hell happened. Why did I go so far? I mean, what the fuck? My partner is solid, so I couldn't imagine that he dropped me. Yet my brain went there immediately, and I asked my buddy, Why did I fall so far? He told me to look at my harness, where two draws could be found. Still clipped to the rope, but obviously no longer on the rock. One had a bolt hanger on the other end. And it was obvious that we had had a major gear failure. My partner descended to me and helped me get back to terra firma, which at that point was 20 feet away. We took a break for a few minutes to assess my damage, and I was able to get up and limp about, but then I got dizzy and felt terrible, so we called for a rescue. The base of the formation has a huge talus field, which I knew was going to be hell for the rescue team to get me through, so my partner took all the gear in both packs and we limped out of the talus field into a clearing at the top of the 60-minute approach to wait for help. After a litter ride, ambulance ride, and ER trip, my damage was a separated rib, two severely bruised feet, a black eye, and I landed on my feet and took a knee to the face, a broken wrist and cuts to the bone on both elbows. (laughs) Amazing, really. I should probably have died. So what happened? Well, the bolts were three-eighths inches, but they were very old and had rusted in the hole. They were also compression studs, Kind of like a button head, but with an actual nut to hold the hanger on. In other words, shit bolts. 
The top bolt broke immediately under my weight, and the lower bolt, which was ten feet below and to the left, rotated off the fucking hanger because of the angle of the rope. So what had happened was, as I was falling backwards towards a granite slab with at least twenty feet of rope out, I was disoriented because when I hit the small ledge, I started cartwheeling as I fell. It was crazy that I landed on my feet after taking a 40-foot cartwheeling screamer for a fall. And the lesson here? Well, don't trust bolts blindly, even if they look okay. And bolts along a traverse that lead to a direction change need to have lockers on them, which is exactly what I used when I went back four years later to try it again. And yeah, when I went back, I stood in the same spot, and I was terrified. Pierce Pond Ghost by Weregehegi I've always thought that there was logical or scientific answers for all of the paranormal phenomenon out there. Probably always would have if not for two nights that I spent at Pierce Pond in June. Both nights were excellent in temperature and weather, and no bugs with at the time that I found quite odd, though. In hindsight, it seems important. I was alone and had a great campfire going and played my harmonica and sang on the first night. As the embers dimmed, I sat on the edge of the lean-to, writing in my journal as the night sounds started to get my attention. They were just different. I knew something or someone was about. I could feel it. Through the moonlight, I could see something that kind of took me aback, and I sat as still as possible while trying to slouch in my sleeping bag. There is no doubt it was a figure that was moving across my sight between me and the pond. It was definitely the form of a spectral, woodsy outdoorsman type with a small pack and what appeared to be fishing gear. The figure faded into the night, and I woke refreshed and relieved to be on the trail in such a beautiful location. I thought about heading out as my first experience like this had me unnerved, but the day was beautiful and I mostly forgot about it as I stayed on to enjoy another day. But as my campfire lit the trees around me that night, the same woodsy character reappeared, and as the fire crackled, its eyes turned towards me, and I was truly frightened for the first time in my life. I ran up the hill away from the lean-to and didn't stop until I could barely breathe. I finally had to slump down next to a tree and wait for the morning. When daylight came... I found my way back to the lean-to, packed up, and went to a friend's place for pancakes and told him what I'd seen. He'd heard of this Spectre Woodsman, too. Seems for years this vision has been haunting a wide area of Maine, although he was unsure if it had ever caused any trouble. He didn't cause me any trouble, but he did make me leave the trail. Rookie Mistake by Fuzzball90 This was my second time ever leading, and it was outdoors at the Red. I was leading this 10B and made a huge rookie mistake. I had my right foot above the last bolt where I had clipped in, behind the rope. When suddenly, that same foot slipped and got caught in the rope, and as I fell away from the wall, it flipped me upside down. Not only did I just fall backwards... Somehow I got rotated, too, so as I was about horizontal, I was facing down at the ground. I started to see the wall coming right at me as I rotated and fell, and somehow stopped myself before busting my face on the rock. I honestly have no idea how I didn't. So now I was hanging upside down. All of my buddies were on the ground freaking out and yelling at me. I'm bloody and cut in some places, and worst of all... I noticed my harness is a little looser around my waist than it should be. I was obviously thinking if I slid out of my harness and fell face first to the ground, I was a goner. I was still probably about 50 feet up at this point. So I got my shit together real quick, because I was freaking the fuck out too. I got my foot untangled and I righted myself. It took another minute to calm down, then took a lot of deep breaths, and then tried to climb again. All the adrenaline pumping through me gave me some serious shakes, so I just came down. It didn't really hit me how much worse it could have been until I went and sat down alone and tried to get more of my shit together. 
It's the scariest thing that has ever happened to me climbing, and it took me a very long time to get it out of my head, even on simple 5.7s outdoors. I mean, good news though, I did get over it, went back to that climb next season, and did it. Fear sort of conquered. What Was in the Mountains by El Rigo 44 I was a southbounder in 1997, and I can tell you that somewhere between the Blue Ridge Mountains and the Smokies, there was some really weird stuff going on. I hiked with a few friends most of the way, but there were times when one or two of us would decide we wanted to blue blaze the section, and the others didn't. So we would usually arrange to meet up in the next nearest town or campground. The thing that's so crazy with southbounding is we had to start later than the northbounders because the trailhead in Maine isn't open as early as Georgia. So by the time we reached southern Virginia, we had passed the majority of the northbounders. My friends decided to blue blaze a section of the trail just north of the Virginia border, and I decided to stay on the main trail. They were two days late to meet up at the next campground, and when they got there, they were not the same. They weren't talkative, and not quiet in that we've been on the trail for two and a half months so we don't have pop culture leaking from our brains anymore quiet. This was uncomfortable quiet. One of my friends decided, when we hit the next town, that she was getting a bus ticket home, and she left. The other friend never did talk about what happened out there on the side trail, but he was jumpy, fidgety, and very frightened of being alone in the dark. He and I finished the trail together, but separately. We didn't talk for a long time after that. About eight years later, we bumped into each other at the funeral of the girl who had left the trail. My friend was crazy. He kept saying, It told me I would be second, and It promised it would see us again. And also, It found her. I'm next. That's what it said. I mean, the shit was freaking me out especially because there was such a drastic change in my friend. He was so outgoing and adventurous before that side trip, and after that he was paranoid and introverted. He died in odd circumstances the next year. I almost went with them on that trip down the side trail. I'm pretty sure if I had, I'd also be dead now too. My Scariest Experience Mountain Climbing, so far, by Mountain Climber. Me and a friend got the bright idea to go climb Orms' buttress up Blanca Peak in the Sangre de Cristo mountain range here in Colorado. The route is notorious for its loose rock, but it only comes in at a 5.6 difficulty rating. Seems easy, right? Well, it is if you stay on route. We banged out the two or three mile approach pretty quickly and got to the base of the wall, which is quite impressive to see, actually. I sat down and started gearing up and munching on some food. My friend was doing the same, but was ready to go a little quicker than I was. We had discussions on the walk in about getting started at the right place on the wall, and the description of start seemed pretty straightforward when we were at home. But now that we were there, it wasn't quite as obvious to us. My friend said, hey, I'm going to scramble up a little ways and take a look. I think it starts right here. The start was class four-ish, so I didn't think too much about it and just said, cool, while I continued to munch away on my food. My friend got about a hundred feet up or so and yelled down to me, hey, bring the rope, I'll set an anchor and we can start from here. I looked up where he was and it didn't seem like he was at en route. But he did have more alpine experience than I did, so I only mildly questioned him about it before heading up with the rope. (laughs) You can see the errors starting to stack up here, I'm sure. I got up to the so-called ledge that he was on, which was more of a small slanty slab that he had managed to build an okay anchor in. Did I mention how loose everything was? I mean, really, really loose. Especially now that we were not en route, and in an area that no one ever climbs. Not that Orms' buttress actually receives a lot of traffic to begin with. The first move off the ledge involved an undercling onto a slopey slab with a bit of grass poking out here and there, and with no gear above the anchor. (laughs) This is supposed to be a 5.6, right? My friend got moving slowly up the pitch, 
way too slow for alpine climbing. But in all honesty, every single hold up there was fractured and seemed like it was going to fall off if you farted on it, let alone pulled it. The best hold I had all day was a wet mound of grass. Every few minutes I could just hear my friend exclaim, Oh God, in a non-humorous sort of way. Later on, he said that every time he would make a move, he would realize that there was still nowhere to put any gear. So apparently that was his coping mechanism. At that point, I could no longer see him due to the bulge I was under, which at least was saving me from the rocks that would come raining down every so often. About three quarters of the way or so through the first rope pitch, I heard the unmistakable sound of a very large rock wobbling around. Anyone that's heard that sound while climbing knows what I'm talking about. My friend yelled out, Giant loose rock! Be careful! Of course, I had no idea what rock he was talking about since I couldn't see him, and every rock on the mountain appeared to be rather large and quite loose. A few minutes later, I heard, Off belay! I was already not excited about climbing the pitch, but I went ahead. It went pretty uneventfully for the first half or so of the climb. Besides the ever-present loose rock and the coming startling reality of how little my gear my friend had been able to get in while leading the pitch. I knew I was getting closer to the anchor and was starting to feel somewhat relieved. There was a ledge above me that was about three feet wide by probably fifteen feet or so long, and it appeared to be a good rest spot before attempting to pull over the small overhang that was above the ledge. Obviously, we had left 5.6 terrain a long time ago. I reached up and grabbed onto a large and what appeared to be stable rock and mantle up onto the ledge. I stood there for a couple of minutes feeling around on top of the overhang and trying to find a hold that didn't feel like it was going to totally explode when I waited it. I was now standing on the large rock that I had used to pull onto the ledge. Once I figured out my move, I went for it. I stepped out a little wider to the right on a rock and as soon as I waited that foot, the entire rock I was standing on teetered and fell. It was maybe the loudest and most frightening sound I had ever heard. It was like something out of a dream, it was that surreal. I mean, it didn't just tumble, it shot straight down the side of the mountain and exploded. It was roughly the size of a large coffee table. As I watched it fall, I just thought, my friend pulled on that thing and so did I. If he had pulled on it just wrong, we would have both been dead. I mean, straight up, no questions asked. If I had pulled on it wrong, maybe we wouldn't be dead. But I can't imagine the situation would have been good. After figuring out how to pull the overhang, which was now even harder since I was standing three feet lower sands the giant rock, I made it up to the anchor. My friend's first words to me were, I can't believe we're not dead. I heard the rock fall and I was just waiting to get yanked off the mountain. His anchor was as good as it could have been, but it involved two eh, pieces and a slung horn that was highly suspect. We sat there for a few minutes and talked about what to do. We decided to give it one more try and at least get onto the route. There wasn't really any bailout options where we were. So I led about another hundred feet, attempting a rising traverse to what I thought would be the route but I never got to anything that felt right. It got easy for a little bit, so we started simul-claiming until I had finally had enough. I built a small, somewhat decent anchor and brought my friend up. He looked at me and said, You want a bail? My answer was a resounding yes. And now the fun of building a rappel anchor began, which is great when everything is completely loose, dirty, and slopey. I had my friend put me on belay, and I climbed up about ten feet to the most attached-looking rock I could see. I plugged in a cam, and it looked solid, so I hung there for a minute to think how best not to get us killed. The boulder looked solid enough, but our thoughts of what was solid were pretty warped by this point. I looked behind the rock to see if I could sling, which I could, but the area behind it was so filled with loose rock and dirt that I could set the sling enough down to make me comfortable. I spent about 30 minutes basically honey-badgering the hell out of the area behind the rock. Throwing rocks over my shoulder and digging loose dirt out, I finally got the sling set and backed it up with a worthless nut. I have no idea why I did that. I guess it just made me feel better. 
I equalized the little anchor between the sling and the cam and came off belay. My friend went on rappel from ten feet below me and slowly slid down, trying not to bounce onto the attached rock. We had spied a class four ledge down and left, and the rope just made it, thankfully. I repelled without incident. I couldn't help but feel spooked as we walked right by the area where the rock fell. We made it back to our tent where my worried girlfriend was waiting. She had gone out and climbed another route in the area that day and had gone back to the tent hours earlier. Lots of beer was had that evening, and a lot of lessons were learned. Luckily, we both came out uninjured somehow. Why I Hike Armed by MSMC A few years back, I was hiking a section of the North Umpqua Trail with my sister-in-law. This is in the northern part of southern Oregon. It's a 72-mile trail broken into sections that can easily be hiked in a day. At the time, I lived about midway up the trail, fairly remote in a small community. It was in mid-fall this one day when we set out. The trail was running along the south side of the North Umpqua River and was pretty up and down in the beginning. We made it to a fairly flat section that was running just above the river, and there was this beautiful view of the river through the trees, so we stopped to get some pictures and take a water break. For some reason, I felt extremely uncomfortable there, like someone was watching us. I slowly turned my head to look behind us, across the trail and up a very small incline. Through the trees I could see a small meadow, and across the meadow, maybe 15 yards from us, was a tent, an old canvas-style tent. As I was looking, I noticed bones strung from the trees all around the meadow, like creepy death wind chimes. My stomach just clenched and dropped. I leaned into my sister-in-law and whispered, Do not, do not turn around and look behind us. Just continue walking up the trail and run when I tell you. We were close enough to the river that nobody even standing next to us could have heard this. She did exactly as I told her, setting off at the brisk walk we'd been at before. We got maybe ten yards and I could hear footsteps through the forest floor coming from behind and slightly above us. That part of the forest is very dense. There's a thick moss cover under the trees, so footsteps on it make a very specific sound. I leaned forward and told her to pick up her speed. She did, I did, and so did whoever was behind us. I leaned forward again and told her to run as fast as she could and not to stop until I told her to. For two middle-aged women, both slightly overweight, we ran like the damn wind. I just kept telling her, go, go, go! I could see ahead of us that the trail made an incline and veered off to the right along the river and around a cliff. I knew at that point that whoever it was following us was going to have to come down onto the trail or stop. We just kept running. We probably ran at least a mile after that, even though we could no longer hear anyone behind us or above us. That section of the trail was about nine miles, and we were not halfway through when this happened. We eventually slowed down, but just hurried as fast as we could the rest of the way. We had arranged for her younger brother, not my ex, to pick us up. We had made it to the next trailhead fairly early, so when we made our way out onto 138 and started walking east towards home, we knew that he would find us. He did, and was shocked to hear our story. We got home and immediately called our local sheriff, who lived just above us at the ranger station. He came to the house and heard our story, and he explained it might be a day or two before they could get on the trail as they had a missing hunter at the time that they were still searching for. So a few days went by, and then he showed up at our house to let me know that we were not crazy or imagining things, and someone really had chased us. I asked what they had found out and who it was. He looked down at the ground and then looked up and said, I'm not going to tell you what we found or who it was. Because if I do, you will never hike anywhere again. What we found was not normal, but we assure you it will not happen up here again. He then instructed me to never, ever hike unarmed again. I never found out what they found or who it was out there, 
and I never hiked that section of trail again, and it completely burnt last year. I also have never hiked unarmed ever again. That was huge for me, as I was not a gun person. I had many incidents living up there in a national forest with wild animals and other strange things, but nothing ever scared me as much as that day. Dangerous Spot by Anonymous I was simul repelling a dedicated rappel route off the back of a long multi-pitch we had finished. It had never been climbed and had no pro whatsoever. My partner and I both accidentally rappelled past the anchors. They were facing away from us on the backside of another face and were really hard to find. And there we were, hanging on our ropes like a couple of jackasses with two options in front of us. One, ascend the rope on Prusix, which would have been a bit of a bitch. Or two, Climb the rock in front of us, even though it was likely not clean and probably had a loose hold or two. We opted for option two, and my friend took the lead. He was taking up the slack as he climbed and kept walking his prusik attached under the rappel up the rope. Then, for whatever reason, he decided that this was too hard and just started climbing without doing it. So there he was, climbing without any pro and by the time he reached the anchors, a big loop of slack that would have resulted in like a 40-plus foot fall hanging from his rappel. Additionally, my ass was hanging on a couple of holds on a blank vertical face, so if I fell, I was going for a ride past a fucking roof with a face with zero holds on it. At that point, I was definitely not happy. I decided to stay quiet as he was doing his thing, because I didn't want to spook him into falling. He made it up to the anchors and started setting up a belay for me, during which he unclipped his rappel from the rope because of all the slack. Now remember, this is a simul rappel. My partner just took me off belay, and I'm attached to one side of the rope. If I fell, I was falling 150 feet until the knot in his side of the rope caught on the anchors, and I was just a little under 100 feet off the ground. You can do the math. So, I wouldn't have gotten caught by the rope. I'd just go splat on the boulders. I got a little cold sweat going because I was hanging off of two okay holds, but nothing I could hold on to forever. I yelled up to him and told him that he'd just unclipped me from the system, and that if I fall, nothing's going to stop me. He got a look of, oh shit, I just fucked up, in his face, and he finally went and clipped his rappel back in. Then he unweighted his anchor system by grabbing on the chains. These were all hanging rappels, no ledges. And unclips both slings. Now he's holding onto the fucking chains with nothing else between him and being worm food, fucking around with his rappel and eventually clipping back in. After experiencing this incredibly sketchy moment, and I will say he's an otherwise experienced climber, I climbed up to the anchors pulling in the slack as I went. And when I got there, I told him that if he had fallen while pulling his stunt of holding onto the chains with no ledge to stand on, I would have been stranded with only one side of the rope and no protection, and he would have cratered 200 feet below. So, yeah, thankfully, we didn't end up shit creek without a paddle. But Jesus Christ, man. This was my best friend, and I trust him with my life. I chalked that one up to a momentary lapse in judgment, which was totally out of character for him. It's all cool now. The Scorched Man by Brad Lane It's taken some time for me to even process the events in my own head. But just of lately, I've been able to think about this weird thing that happened to me on a trail sometime in late August or early September. I had a random week off of work, and keeping a busy schedule, I felt it was a rarity. I was getting a little restless and knew that I had to blow off some stress for a bit and explore the great outdoors. On the account that I was so ready for a vacation, and no one else's schedule matched up for an adventure week, I decided to go at it solo and backpack alone for a week. It had been years since I last backpacked by myself, and for some reason I had convinced myself I once enjoyed it. But when I dropped my car at the trailhead in Catawba, about 15 miles from Newcastle, and I started hiking... I noticed the different atmosphere backpacking alone provides. 
I couldn't shake how incredibly silent it was. I could hear my own breathing, and every now and then I would look over my shoulder quickly in response to random noises. I was almost anxious to begin with, but told myself I just had to get used to this new aspect of backpacking that I wasn't accustomed to. The first night, I managed to set up camp and immediately retired to my tent. I was unusually exhausted, which now seemed as a surprise for the little of sleep I got that night. I tossed and turned, listening to the silent night until late morning when I finally rested my eyes. Well after daybreak, I got out of my tent and drug my feet back to my belongings. It was much later than I had aimed for the night before. I made it about five miles during the day, but it took me the entire afternoon until dark. I was tired and it seemed without having someone to push me along my hiking was considerably slower. I pitched my tent that night, filtered water, and started setting up my cook gear in the dark. It was getting to feel pretty late, and with limited light to cook under, I decided to just eat a pack of raw ramen noodles in my tent. I opened my book to read, but only fell asleep immediately into another half-sleep, half-wrestling match for the night. I remember at one point staring at the top of my darkened tent, not really sure if I was awake or not, and suddenly hearing the loud crunch of footsteps outside my tent. They were going fast as they came, but with the footsteps came something of a grumble. I couldn't actually be sure, and I couldn't distinguish any actual words. But in my mind's eye, I was sure I heard something grumbling to themselves in a deep and agitated voice. I never even got out of my sleeping bag. Not inexperienced with some of the sounds of night and their magnification in the silence, I tried to convince myself it was my ears playing tricks on me. And although I managed to stay in my sleeping bag that night, I didn't fall asleep again until early morning. The next day, I woke up even later and more tired than before. I made a groggy attempt at oatmeal and sat with my breakfast unable to talk to anyone. I got my pack ready in the afternoon sun and headed out. And about three and a half miles later, I dropped my pack and sat watching the sun begin to disappear. I managed to collect a fair amount of firewood, and by the time nightfall came, I had a small fire going with a good collection of firewood piled beneath me. Under the reassuring light of the campfire, I started to become more at ease with the deafening silence of nature. I pulled a cigarette from my pocket and enjoyed a casual smoke as I put my feet up. When I tried to ditch the butt in my weakening flame, my throw was off and it landed outside of the ashes. I got up to fix my mistake and to stoke the fire, when I turned around to go back to my seat, and I saw him. The light was low with my little fire, but I could clearly see a man reaching down with a scorched hand for my firewood. He wore red plaid with large black burns tearing at his trim and a red ashy beard that smoldered at his face. He quickly looked up and his vacant white eyes connected with mine. He gritted his teeth and scrunched his nose towards me before quickly leaving the ring of the firelight. I was shocked. I have never experienced a fear like it. I fell right onto my butt next to the flames. I looked out into the forest and saw nothing but dark shadows and unclear objects. A blank wall of nothing. Of everything. I didn't know what to do. I didn't even yell with no one to hear me but him. So I did what every red-blooded American would do. I packed up my stuff and got the hell out of Dodge. I stumbled through the darkness, half the time with my headlamp off, afraid to be seen or even of seeing anything else. I stumbled along for hours, bumping into trees and tripping every which way. I wasn't even sure where my map and compass were, I just kept moving. I could have been hiking in circles for all I knew. I was driven by my beating heart, and to this day I know I never have been so scared in my life. When dawn finally broke and I could see again, I kept moving. At about 12.30, I started to recognize some signs of civilization. I threw my pack down in a big open pasture, but couldn't see any houses or roads. I knew I had to be close to something, but I was by no means sure where I had ended up. I was almost too tired to think about it. Instead, in a fit of not knowing what to do, but knowing I had to do something, I pitched my tent and ate a large chunk of cheese and salami. After the meal and under the afternoon sun, I almost immediately fell asleep in the grass where I ate my lunch. 
I awoke two to three hours later. The sun had dropped down considerably, and a funny smell filled my nostrils. I blinked a few times, and when the funny smell still persisted, I shot off my back with my heart beating to the sound of something troubling. What I saw was my tent, or what remained of my tent. For now, the only thing left standing was the tent poles that dripped with the oozing leftovers of my tent body. A bubbly layer of melted green plastic lay beneath the poles, with a steady gray smoke rising from the mess. I got up and felt the weight of the sky fall on my head. For a moment, I was sure I had woken up in a horrible nightmare. Without contemplating it much further, I grabbed my water bottle and ran through the empty pasture. By the time I made it to a gravel road, I was out of breath and dripping with sweat. I hastily chugged from my water bottle and wiped my mouth. Down the road I could see a vehicle parked in the dust, and I staggered forward with my hands on my sides, and soon realized it was a sheriff's sedan, and for the first time in a long time I couldn't have been happier to see a law enforcement vehicle. When I got closer to the vehicle, I noticed that it was parked outside of the remains of a charred house. Nothing left standing but the mailbox out front. On the way into town, I didn't tell the officer about my experience, being afraid that he might think I escaped from the loony bin, so instead I asked him about the burnt-down house he had been parked in front of. The sheriff explained to me that four days prior, the same day that I had started my backpacking trip, the house had burned down. They had no known cause, but there was indication of arson. Two daughters, a wife and her husband, were all in the house when the fire started, and none of them made it out alive. Real tragedy, said the sheriff, as he retold the story to me, and I could only shake my head with my bottom jaw hanging low. Who was the scorched man that I had seen in the woods? Eyes on the Mesa by Untaken Account Name I was hiking down off a mesa alone one night and kept getting the feeling that I was being watched. I had a headlamp that I was using in red mode because it was nearly out of batteries and also to preserve my night vision, but mainly because it was almost out of batteries. Anyway, I got the feeling that I was being watched for like the third or fourth time in a row, and I was all about, you know, fuck this, what is this? So I turned around and turned the headlamp to spot mode, full bright white light. I saw a shape or a shadow quickly move behind some bushes like 25 yards behind me. Real low, real fast, real smooth. I stood there for maybe a minute weighing my options and decided I pretty much had none and just had to keep hiking. I started making more noise and tried to look bigger, like by spreading my arms with my rain jacket. And I also found a good sized stick to carry. The worst part was I had to go back to red light mode as I knew I didn't have enough battery life to make it back with the white light mode. I'd turn around occasionally and use the spot mode, and I saw green reflected eyes several times when doing so, always about 25 yards off and always low to the ground. Seemed about the size of a deer, but deer don't hang out that low to the ground, or follow you for miles. Every time I turned around, I saw these eyes, probably about ten times in total. I called my friend after I kept seeing the eyes and hiked the rest of the way down talking to him, basically saying, if I don't get back in about an hour, here's where you can find my body. It was about a five-mile hike, and my light was flickering and dying towards the end. It died right after I got off the mesa, and I hiked the last few miles through fields without a light. Luckily, it was a clear night. The stalking stopped once I left the mesa. At least I think. And that's the story of when I was stalked by a mountain lion all the way off his mesa. I think I was in his hunting territory and it had only just gotten dark. Pretty sure he was curious more than malicious. But yeah, man, that's pretty creepy knowing that you're being followed and watched by an apex predator. Swept Away by Charles W. In 2016, I hiked the California section of the Pacific Coast Trail. This trip brought me to the southern Sierra in the month of June. 
as in many years there was significant runoff from snow melt on the high alpine slopes. Traversing this section of trail many times gave me the confidence to tackle river crossings that would have otherwise given pause. I was surprised by conditions I should have been more prepared for. These conditions led to a dangerous incident that had the potential to end my trip, or considerably worse, death by drowning. I had camped for the night with three friends I'd started hiking with in Southern California. All were stronger hikers, and most mornings they got up earlier and left camp before I did. I caught up with them each evening and enjoyed camping with them. That evening we were camped near Dollar Lake. D had told me that night that if I didn't want to keep up with them in the High Sierra, I didn't have to. If I didn't show up one evening, they'd know I chose to go slower. I had no intention of letting my friends hike ahead and leave me behind. I wanted to keep up. The next day I came to the South Fork of the Kings River. I was alone. After an all-too-quick summary of where the trail crossed the river, I knew it was too fast and deep for me to ford at that location. I moved downstream, hastily finding a place a bit below the trail crossing where the river was broken into three manageable stretches separated by islands. I thought it would be better to do the shorter crossings than crossing the entire stream at one time. I didn't check upstream, and I didn't look any further downstream. I crossed the first section easily, and the second went just as quickly. I walked up and down the second island looking for the best place to cross and started out. I had one whippet, that is, a self-arrest trekking pole. After jumping into the water, I started to cross the river. I lost my footing for a moment, and I found myself stalled in the middle of the deepest and fastest part of the stream. As I tried to get better footing, the river current swept my feet from underneath me, and I immediately fell face down into the river. I was immediately hit with a wave of cold from the water that had been ice merely hours before. I was swept downstream with my pack on. I was underwater, and I couldn't breathe. I tried unsuccessfully to get a toehold on the river bottom so I could get up on my feet. I realized then that I was in a very serious situation. No one knew where I was. I had no idea what was downstream. I mean, was there a log or a pile of logs or rocks below me that I could get caught up in? Was my gear in my sleeping bag wet? Was I even going to be able to get out of this? I thought about my mom, and I could remember wondering how long it had been since I told her that I loved her. I remembered the story of a ranger I'd met years earlier of hiking up and down the river canyons while doing a sweep, looking for missing people, and I wondered if that would be my fate. I was being held down by the weight of my pack. I was being beat up by the rocks on the bottom of the river as I was being dragged downstream. Then my leg got caught between a couple of large rocks. The river flipped me around so my head was now downstream with one of my feet hung up. I'd been a scuba diver for years, and so I tried not to panic. I knew I could still function for a bit without a breath, but that same experience that kept me calm told me that fighting the force of a raging current, whether in the ocean or a mountain river, is not easy. After what seemed like in an eternity, my foot came free. Then the river turned, and the current slowed. I was pushed to the slower, far side of the bank, and I fought to turn over on my back and felt the buoyancy of my backpack now underneath me. After my first breath, I looked up as I crossed under the branches of a bush on the bank of the river and I grabbed one. I was able to work my way hand over hand up the limb to the edge of the water, and then I climbed up the bank. I was stranded in a deep-walled canyon in the late afternoon. I was completely wet, and the clothes on the outside of my pack were sopped, the sun would soon disappear for the night. Walking upstream on the far side of the river brought me to the original trail crossing in a campsite on the riverbank. There was a hiker there who must have gotten quite a sight. I was bleeding from my hands, arms, and legs, as well as dripping water, and more than a little stunned. After a quick check, I laid my things out to dry. My sleeping bag was dry, and so was my down jacket. I tried to lay my wet clothes out in a patch of sun, but it went away quickly. So I packed up and headed up the canyon. I lost my sun hat and sunglasses. My stocking cap was gone and my sleeping quilt didn't have a hood. 
one water bottle was gone and my phone, my navigation clock and camera, was dead. My paper maps were wet. I thought as I hiked, trying to develop some body heat about the mistakes that led to this, and I realized I hadn't made very good choices. Leaving the trail to cross a river where no one knew where I was rated high on the list of bad decisions. So did not thoroughly checking for better crossings in both directions from the trail crossing. I should have scouted downstream for what I would encounter in the river if the crossing went bad. Not packing some clothing articles in my pack or a stuff sack wasn't the best solution, and I should have secured the other equipment. I regretted leaving my sunglasses on my hat for the crossing. I was in the middle of the southern Sierra in June, with quite a bit of snow and no sunglasses. Snow blindness felt imminent. I've had a couple of years to think about this incident. Last summer, a hiker died in that same river crossing. As hikers, we think a lot about the snow in the Sierra. And to those who don't ski or live in a northern climate, snow seems menacing. But I often wonder if it is not the river crossings that pose the most danger. There are no ice axes or self-arrest poles to save us if we fall in a river. The only things that can help us if a crossing goes bad are the decisions and preparation we make before we cross. Hey gang, thanks for listening to this episode of Uncle Josh's True Scary Stories. If you have a true scary story of any nature that you'd like to hear narrated on this channel or the podcast, email it to UncleJoshTrueScaryStories at gmail.com. I read them all. If you haven't, please like, share, and subscribe to this channel and share my podcast wherever you can. Follow me on social media. Links to that are in the description below. And if you'd like to take it a step further and support the channel in a different way, there's a link to my Patreon page as well as my storefront at tpublic.com. Get yourself some Campfire Crew merchandise. And as promised, everybody, check out this awesome song. It's called Same Rope from my friend Bob Malucci. He's a great singer-songwriter here in Western New York. He's got a new album out called Resonance. Find it wherever you find your music online. So sit back and enjoy. But before you sit back and enjoy it, be excellent to each other. And remember, be wary of things that go bump in the night. It could be anything. A ghost, a monster, or the guy next door. Swinging from the same rope Trying to reach the same boat Trying not to drown Beneath the city lights Where the skyline meets the sea We find solace in the night you and me stars are shining down they light our way home in this ghost town a dance of shadows the sun is up soon we chase dreams that echo underneath the moon it's time to defy for the first time in your life it's time to ignite the fire inside So let's be dreamers If only for tonight And nothing's gonna break our stride And nothing's gonna break our stride And nothing's gonna break our stride We're all swinging from the same rope Trying to reach the same boat Trying not to drown 